say hello to Michael. I was expecting you to only join us later, but it's a great pleasure to have you so early on. Thanks so much. Well, yeah, I, I thought I should try to wake up and get going for this. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So thank you so much. So I'll just show some introductory slides because some people haven't attended our talks before. Um, and then I'll play your talk. And, you know, like I said, I really encourage people to pose questions in the chat throughout your lecture, and then we can answer them towards the end. So just so we can get an idea for time, so Michael's talk is about 40 minutes. Um, so we'll try to be done within an, an hour or just over, but I, I don't plan on keeping everybody, you know, here till late. And I'm sure Michael also wants to get a start on his day. So having said that, I'm just going to share some slides initially, and then we'll play Michael's talk, and then we'll do the Q&A. Can everybody see that? Yeah. Just hide the controls. All right, fantastic. So tonight's talk is entitled Psychedelics in Human Adaptation and Evolution with Dr. Michael Winkleman. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have him on board. Um, just a disclaimer. So firstly, we are obviously recording the session and, and it will be available on a, on a, on our YouTube channel. We are only focused on the clinical use of these medicines. So that's really important. Just to give everybody an overview of the current state of mental health in Australia. So unfortunately, one in five Australian adults had a chronic mental illness pre-COVID. Coming out of COVID now, unfortunately, four in five Australians are saying that their mental health has actually deteriorated and 34% of Australians have said that their mental health has actually declined. Furthermore, one in eight Australians are now on, on um, antidepressants. Sadly, we had reports that children as, as, sorry, children as young as 10 were being prescribed antidepressants. Having said that, if we look at it on a global level and Michael, I'm sure can uh, tell us about what's going on in his part of the world, so globally, there is an estimated increase of more than 129 million cases of major depression disorder and also anxiety. And now the most common mental illnesses are PTSD, anxiety, depression, and also addiction. As a result, so the big elephant in the room is that there's been a lack of um, innovation over the last 50 years. And, you know, that's really where... Um, the uh, uh, psychedelic assisted therapies come in and we will speak about them obviously a bit later. So there has been no improvement in treatment outcomes over the last 50 years. In now in regards to depression, only 35% of sufferers experience some sort of remission. 40 to 60% of patients actually show some response but then sadly 50 to 80% of patients then relapse after treatment. PTSD is even harder to treat. And we have had reports that the rates of remission are as low as 5%. Therefore, a more of the same approach is not going to solve the problem. So as a result, so My Medicine Australia has been established. We are a registered charity. We've been, we are now entering into our third year. So time definitely does fly. Um, and, and our aim is to alleviate the suffering caused by mental illness in Australia by expanding the treatment options available to practitioners as well as their patients. We are establishing safe and effective psychedelic assisted treatments to cure a range of mental illnesses. Uh, the founders of the charity are Tanya de Jong, AM, and Peter Hunt. Our primary focus is on using psilocybin to treat depression and also MDMA to treat PTSD. And we are measuring our success on three core platforms. They are number one, that we see these treatments become an integral part of, of our mental health system. And we also want to see a huge increase in the rates of patients going through remission, leading to a substantial improvement in the mental health stats, which, which I presented earlier. And we also wanna see that these treatments become accessible and affordable to all Australians in need. 
just to give everybody an overview of these treatments. So as we know, we know a person only needs two to three dose sessions and that's it. The medicines themselves have been shown to be curative and also not palliative and Michael can give us background as to how they work. And they have been found to be a very safe and a medically controlled environment. Now, both MDMA and also psilocybin have been given breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the States. Um, and the Australian TGA is going to open up for public submissions um, by the end of this month. So, so stay tuned for that and we will um, give you some news about that hopefully next week. How the medicines actually work. So with um, psilocybin, it focuses on the default mode network and that's part of the brain which is associated with, with many mental illnesses. Um, it then pr um, promotes a form of active coping. And in fact, one can see an, an, an fMRI scan from Beckley University, how a brain just becomes more active and the neural pathways start reconnecting. And that itself has got a positive effect on, on the patient. <clears throat> Um, and I'm going to finish up with this briefly. Um, last year, we saw two pivotal trials come out. So the MAPS phase three trial demonstrated that 67% of, of um, patients who um, received MDMA assisted therapy no longer qualified for a PTSD diagnosis, which is just phenomenal. And 88% of them actually experienced a clinically meaningful reduction in their symptoms. And the trial participants had had um, PTSD for an average of about 14 years. So really just phenomenal trials. And then coming out of the, and then coming out of the UK, and this was published in one of the world's top medical journals. So, so then this trial demonstrated that two sessions of uh, psilocybin assisted psychotherapy were as effective in treating moderate to severe depression over the course of six weeks as as um, having a daily intake of standard SSRIs, antidepressants combined with psychotherapy. Just to give everybody an overview as to what's going on in the world. Um, so there are trials which are looking at uh, treating eating disorders, addiction. Um, that, now there are schemes being set up in the US, Australia, and also Israel to enable physicians to apply for a special approval to give patients access to these. Um, last year, we saw the Australian government grant $15 million towards psychedelic therapies. And now out of those grants, we've now seen seven clinical trials be, um, which have been established here. We have also seen the Australia's TGA conduct an independent review last year based on the applications that we submitted to them in regards to the downgrading of psilocybin and MDMA from Schedule 9 to a Schedule 8 substance. Um, and based on the feedback that we got, we actually resubmitted applications to them in March of this year. And like I said, the TGA is going to open up for public submissions at the end of this month, and we will pass on some more info about that. And also we see what's going on in the US and Canada as well. And I'll finish up with that for now and, I'll, and I will pass on to Michael's talk and then I'll carry on a bit later. Right, how's that? I think that's good. So this uh, presentation on psychedelic sociality and, and human evolution is an idea that I've been working on for a long time. Uh, I'm certainly not the first person to come up with this idea. It has a, a long, famous and infamous history, including Weston Labar and of course, Terence McKenna. Um, but they didn't have the information that we have today. And so what I want to be presenting to you today is some understandings that's really based on what clinical and psychedelic sciences have discovered in the last, you know, 10 to 15 years. I uh, made my first effort at 
explaining the basic ideas that I'm going to present today in, in my book, Shamanism. Uh, but mostly it's been things that have developed since then. And uh, most of the articles that I will be uh, counting on today are, are there at researchgate.net. Um, but most of what I have to say today really comes from just one article. And this is a co-authored article with Jose Rodriguez Arce on psychedelic sociality and human evolution, in which we bring together lots of different kinds of information to help us develop a better understanding of just how it is that psychedelics must have necessarily intersected with the human past. So my PowerPoint doesn't have uh, references in it, but there's lots of them, about five or six pages worth in this paper, available both at Frontiers and on ResearchGate. Um, the overall view of this talk today, uh, I'm gonna characterize this psychointegration. It's a term I've used for many years as an alternative for hallucinogens and psychedelics. And it reflects an understanding of how it is that psychedelics like psilocybin affect the overall dynamics of the brain. And what I have proposed, and which I will partially touch on here, is the idea that what these substances do is create an enhanced integration of the ancient cognitive processes of the brain. And in particular, uh, liberation of the innate modules and their integration. So I'm going to begin with a very evolutionary perspective. You know, how do we know that our hominin ancestors consume psilocybin? Well, the same way that we know that they consume bananas, okay? Other primates do, our closest cousins in the great apes do. And we'll look at a variety of ecological and behavioral patterns that lead us to conclude that we must have encountered and adapted to these very powerful substances in the environment millions of years ago. Uh, one of the important factors that encourage this adaptation has to do with the relationship between psilocybin and the serotonogenic nervous system, uh, the most important neuromodulatory system, which is also stimulated at a number of its different types of receptor sites by psilocybin. But perhaps the most important early adaptation has to do with its enhancement of our adaptation to stress. And we'll look at some very specific serotonogenic systems stimulated by psilocybin that give us an adaptive stress response rather than a passive one. The, the broad framework that we're going to use here for addressing these questions is what's called psychedelic instrumentalization. It's a takeoff from the broader concept of drug instrumentalization, which is the idea that we use drugs because they were helpful, not because that they were addictive or debilitating, but because they helped us adapt. They helped us you know, deal with stress. They kept us awake when we needed to be awake. They, they let us sleep. It's a well-established perspective in the evolutionary sciences. But for some curious reason, the people that propose drug instrumentalization in general don't even want to talk about psychedelic instrumentalization and don't even want to let us publish in the main journals. Somehow, psychedelic instrumentalization pushes the envelope too far. But we're going to make a, a very powerful argument, I think, that psychedelic instrumentalization was key to human evolution in a lot of different ways, but in particular through of facilitating the development of the cognitive niche. The cognitive niche is, is the cultural model that we are able to develop because we have certain kinds of cognitive capabilities. And the cultural niche is considered to be the most important factor in human evolution. It was through creating shared models of how to adapt to the environment, get our food, that we were able to move beyond simple physical adaptations. And I'm gonna point out that psilocybin has a number of social, emotional, and cognitive effects that are going to enhance the ability to participate in the cognitive niche. So the neurological perspectives are sort of this balance between what does the clinical data say and what do we know about what these substances do in the brain? It's going to start off with the idea that they enable us to integrate information in a normal but normally rare way, something that's analogous to dreams dreams being an important form of cognitive integration that occurs during the sleeping periods. The psychedelics mimic that state, as well as producing a variety of psychosocial effects, making us more open to others, less fearful, uh, more likely to bond with other people, uh, more extroverted, uh, greater understanding of other people's intentions, 
as well as creating a variety of information dynamics. Now, what happens under psychedelics is uh, disabling of the top down brain control and an enabling of a bottom up integrative mode of information transfer. It also creates a broad functional integration, long distance integration across the brain. Of course, perhaps one of the most significant things that the psychedelics did was to stimulate the origins of a natural religion, shamanism. Um, it's what a lot of what I've written about, but I'm only going to just touch on it briefly today, focusing on some of these other issues. So how do we know that our hominid ancestors consumed psychedelic mushrooms? Well, we look at the great apes and other primates, they ingest medicinal plants, they even eat mushrooms, they use in medicinal plants intentionally to treat problems like intestinal parasites, gastrointestinal problems, uh, that fungi consumption and self-medication is widely documented among primates. So there's no reason to question that our hominid ancestors also did this. When did we start doing it? Probably at least two and a half million years ago when our exposure to psychedelic fungi intensified when we were present on the grasslands of Africa. And there in bovine feces, we would have encountered psilocybin mushrooms growing. And this is something that would have been a part of our adaptation because first we were scavenging carcasses of bovines killed by carnivores, and later we were hunting them. And even after the movement out of Africa, psilocybin mushrooms are found in most eco zones of the world, probably only the, the Arctic and Antarctic uh, and the subarctic re regions don't have some psilocybin containing mushrooms. So the widespread presence of psilocybin in the past in the environment of evolutionary adaptation assured that hominids would have encountered mushrooms and would have experimented with them. Indeed, one might argue that an adaptation to understanding edible mushrooms, toxic mushrooms, and psychedelic psilocybin mind altering mushrooms had to be a very early adaptation and may even have some biological components to it. So psilocybin was a common element in the environment of evolutionary adaptation. And we know this today for a number of reasons. One being that there are a number of different genre with psilocybin. They're found almost in all eco zones. And this is not just a recent phenomena. We know this because there are region specific psilocybin containing mushrooms that are still only found in certain regions of the world, implying a great antiquity and of course, an adaptation to their specific eco zone. Of course, in addition to the psilocybin mushrooms, we have the Amanita species worldwide. Uh, some of their biological mechanisms are distinctly different from psilocybin uh, acting on the GABAergic neurons, but the net effects on cognitive function, I think, is very much the same, just different mechanisms. Now, this encounter with these mushrooms worldwide happened long in the past, long before modern culture civilization. And we see this as attested to in petroglyphs all over the world, in Russia, Bronze Age in Europe, in Spain, where they've actually been able to identify the likely species based upon detailed features in Africa and Algeria, a sketch here, uh, another. Even in Egypt, it's been proposed that the Egypt crown was in fact modeled after the most potent of the mushrooms, the one right here before the cap opens up. Um, I've recently done research in India, Kajuraho, the famous Kama Sutra temples, where we find on the thresholds of almost every temple in what is one of the most important uh, temple sites in India, mushrooms you have to step on the head of the mushroom basically to get into the sanctuary um why wasson missed these i don't know but clearly india has uh, an entheogenic background the mayans had it the famous mushroom stones you find even amanita ceramics from hundreds of years ago in mesoamerica uh, peruvian mushroom stones mushroom artifacts around argentina Virtually all around the world, wherever you look, you're going to find an ancient past representations of mushrooms. This shows that this was important to religions. And indeed, it probably wasn't a significant factor in the evolution of shamanism from a baseline of 
hominid, hominid ritual practices. Can't talk about that much here today, but I've explored in these two articles, psychedelics, uh, shamanism and psychedelics, where I've looked at an evolutionary paradigm for understanding why it is that we should consider psilocybin to have been a central factor in motivating this development. And basically because the effects of psilocybin and the nature of, of shamanic practice is very similar. Visionary experiences, soul flight, you know, internal powers that you experience in the body, divination, animal relations, death and uh, rebirth experiences, even altruistic behavior. We now know from double blind clinical studies that psilocybin induces altruism and it has a long term effect. And we know from double blind clinical studies that mystical and spiritual experiences can be provoked by psilocybin in controlled conditions. About 80% of the people score at their highest level in their entire life in terms of mystical experiences on their first psilocybin experience. So my other article here explores how this evolutionary you know, interaction emerged between psychedelics and shamanism, with shamanism basically developing a ritual paradigm that enhanced the ability to incorporate these effects. Presence of entheogens in world religions in India, in Judaism, in ancient Egypt, and ancient traditions of Europe, even in Christianity. There's a special issue of Journal of Psychedelic Studies 2019 on psychedelics and history and world religion. They are everywhere in our past. The question is, how do we incorporate that understanding into how we now review our past? I'm going to suggest that the implications of this transcultural phenomenon, the worldwide presence of psilocybin mushrooms, indicates we need to have a biological perspective. We need to view the entheogenic experience as a biological universal. Human cultures everywhere encountered these substances, used them, had mystical and spiritual experiences, and figured out how to incorporate these into their culture into their religions, into their spiritual practice and, sh and shamanic activity. And this idea of cycle integration that I want to present here is basically the notion that the effects of psilocybin stimulated both serotonergic and dopaminergic systems. And the net effect was to invoke a bottom-up dynamic in the brain that integrated our unconscious brain mechanisms into our consciousness. So we have evidence of the effects of drugs on human evolution, beginning with special enzymes that we have and metabolic processes that take what are normally considered to be plant toxins designed to deter consumption and turn them into neurotransmitters. That in essence, the ability to consume and metabolize these substances gave us an enhanced performance on a variety of goal-directed behaviors that enabled us to have more energy, more endurance, to resist pain, or to relax or be more sociable when necessary. So this idea that there was positive effects on adaptation through the utilization of psychedelics has led to this, or utilization of drugs in general, has led to this drug instrumentalization theory that says that drug use was functional. It was not an addictive breakdown in our you know, defensive mechanisms, rather, it was doing something that was adaptive and enabled us to more effectively function in the physical and the social environments in which we found ourselves. So the psychedelic instrumentalization is our novel approach here. And the idea is that psychedelics went far beyond the stimulants and the pain numbers to enhance performance on a variety of fitness relevant behaviors that in fact, they enhanced our ability to participate in a cognitive niche, to imagine cognitive niches, to create new cognitive niches. And in contrast to some claims about psychedelics being dangerous, toxic substances that had to be avoided, what we know in fact is that psilocybin is far less toxic than most of the pharmaceuticals being prescribed by doctors. Its therapeutic index is in the 600s. Its toxicity is virtually negligible. You'd have to eat like 16 kilos of most psilocybin mushrooms to get anywhere near a toxic dose. Rather than being a toxin, it had to be considered something that increased our fitness because ingesting these plants 
enabled us to utilize their compounds, which re resemble our endogenous neurotransmitters. And so that there are a number of different adaptive results of using these substances that enhanced our capacities to do a variety of social and cognitive behaviors. How do they act on the brain? Well, they act first on the serotonin pathways. Psilocybin is an agonist. It stimulates the serotonin receptors. Serotonin is key to higher cognitive processes. And significantly, it regulates the triune brain. Basically, it's a repressive mechanism. It keeps the emotional and behavioral aspects of the brain repressed so that the cognitive ones can have full reign. But psilocybin and other 5-HT2 psychedelics also have secondary effects. Eventually, they block out the serotonin sites because they're not as susceptible to reuptake. And so the serotonin system eventually gets blocked out. Its repressive mechanisms are freed, and it liberates the dopaminergic brain, which is then projecting all of its activity into the frontal cortex. And a system that evolved in mammals for bonding and attachment underwent a variety of evolutionary developments in the hominid line, including an enhanced ability to integrate groups, for instance, through singing and dancing and chanting, which stimulate the uh, endorphins. And in essence, it liberated the lower aspects of the brain, this triune brain, the reptilian brain, the paleomammalian brain, and it enabled these ancient psychological, emotional, and cognitive processes to be brought up into consciousness. It's a top, uh, a bottom up dynamic, which replaces the normal top down control by the brain. It also enhances what uh, Fred Previk has called extra personal cognition. It enhances our ability to think about things away from our physical body, things distant in space and time. Perhaps the most significant first adaptation provided by uh, the use of psilocybin had to do with stress adaptation. Uh, humans have two serotonin-mediated responses to stress and adversity. One that's mediated by the 5-HT1A receptor, and it's the default signaling system that basically enables a passive coping strategy. You endure, you tolerate stress, you just put up with what's bothering you. But we also have a 5-HT2A receptor signaling system that's an active coping, coping strategy. It enables us to respond to stress by changing stressful circumstances or our relationship to them. And psilocybin and other serotonogic psychedelics preferentially engage the 5-HT2A receptor signaling system. And by stimulating this system, which evolved to mediate rapid and deep learning when faced with environmental crises and other stressful conditions, it increased our ability to adapt through changing how it is that we related to the problems that we encountered. So what we know from laboratory studies is that psilocybin stimulates a variety of responses of the 5-HT2A receptor signaling system. It elevates cortical neuroplasticity and enabling us to develop new uh, kinds of connections. It enhances our associative learning. It reduces stress and anxiety. It enhances patience and it increases neuroplasticity, which enables us to rewire our brains to adapt in new ways. And it enhances both creativity and sociality. So what I think was the next major effect in terms of psychedelic instrumentalization was its enhancement of a unique hominin capacity, the socio-cognitive niche or cultural niche, which is to say the socially shared mental constructions that enable us to pass on information from person to person, generation to generation. In the case of human beings, this socio-cognitive niche or cultural niche is considered to be the most important factor in hominid evolution, basically being able to share information from generation to generation. And what was required for this kind of development 
was the ability to share information, to share models. And what we see as the uniquely human capacities for cognition, sociality, communication, and learning are all enhanced by psilocybin. So the psychedelic instrumentalization hypothesis is that by taking psilocybin, we enhanced our capacities for complex social interaction, to engage with, engage with others without fear, uh, to feel more connected to others, and to create larger social groups that could tolerate each other. So the adaptive benefits should be understood in a Baldwinian evolutionary model in the sense that psilocybin stimulated certain kinds of capacities. And those kinds of capacities then were instrumentalized in cultural niche construction. And consequently, those of our ancestors who had the best pre-existing neural and genetic structures for utilizing these substances were the most successful in entering into the cognitive niche, sharing cultural models and learning from others in those cultural models. And so by that kind of environmental influence, the hominin ancestors were selected for those who could most effectively utilize the uh, psilocybin effects for managing psychological distress, for treating health problems, for enhancing social interaction, for creating better interpersonal relations, for enhancing our cognitive processes, for engaging in collective decision making, for being able to see things in a new and different way. And of course, the facilitation of collective ritual and religious activities that must also be considered one of the most significant effects that psilocybin had in creating a new way of relating to the world using rituals to heal, integrate communities, and to address social problems. So I would like to present the overall dynamic of psychointegration as being one in which the normal dynamic of top-down control is replaced. One of the things that psilocybin does in the brain is disable the prefrontal cortex, which links the frontal cortex with the lower brain, and disables the default mode network, which uh, keeps our habitual, emotional, personal, social reference, personal history dynamics together. And now, what we normally have is our personal history and our personal reference and our sense of self and social relations doesn't fit together. In fact, what often happens in these conditions is the eagle, of, eagle loss experience. Uh, we no longer have this sense of being our normal self. And what we get instead is this amplification of activity from the lower parts of the brain, the reptilian brain and the limbic areas of the brain are now able to send all their information up. So the basal brain areas are engaged in a serotonin mediated theta wave synchronization of not only the lower brains, but it eventually projects up the neuraxis and synchronizes the frontal cortex. So we're getting a basal limbic frontal synchronization and even a right hemisphere left hemisphere synchronization in essence an integration of the whole brain rather than just the top-down dynamic and this synchronization of the frontal cortex with this lower brain dynamic means that we're getting the integration of our behavioral emotional and unconscious dynamics as well as what can be called paleo mentation and emotional mentation all of this is getting pushed pushed up into the the frontal cortex, the big drive. And there, all this information is getting integrated into what is an intrinsic and holistic state of psychological integration of unconscious and conscious dynamics. One of the significant ways in which this is manifested is through the effects of the psilocybin in terms of creating a visual kind of experience. Uh, what I would suggest is that hallucinations were the first symbols it's like what is that what does that mean we're getting information provided for us in a way that reflects the overall increased responsiveness of the brain to all kinds of stimuli if you have your eyes open you get the sensory stimuli and multi-sensory processing exemplified in synesthesia uh, but when you close your eyes, then now what you're getting is an enhanced input of information from within the brain. 
and psychedelics expand the activity in the visual cortex. It not only enhances visual cortex activity, but it enhances the connection, the functional connectivity of the visual cortex with the other association areas of the brain. But I think what we have to understand is that this primary process thinking of psychedelics is really a form of thought. And it's a form of thought that existed for millions of years before we had language. It's a form of thought that's found in our, our ape cousins. And that this really is a form of symbolic representation that is a natural part of the brain that is part of everyday life. And it's how we function in everyday life. Uh, but this presentational symbolism gets particularly stimulated under certain conditions. For instance, it's the representational system that underlies dreams. Notably, dreams are largely visual and not verbal. They reflect this ability of the brain to represent for itself important information that then is integrated. That's the function of it in dreaming, is the integration of information through the visual modality. And so this mode of visual mentation, which existed long before language, was what enhanced the capacity for the cognitive niche capabilities that permitted cultural niche constructions. And not only does any cultural niche construction creative and novel ones. Was psilocybin part of the expansion of the visual cortex in human evolution? Come up with a better reason why we needed to have better visual processing than the great apes. They have very good visual processing. We do it even better, hardwired in our brain. It was an intrinsic cognitive process that was part of the mechanisms used in dreaming and understanding everyday life that then were integrated and even enhanced through the psychedelic stimulation. Indeed, we ought to consider psychedelics as a perfect tool for understanding the system that emerges in fantasy and daydreaming and nighttime dreaming and mystical visions, uh, a system that existed long before language and provided an image-based cognitive modality that enabled us to think, manipulate images a metacognitive system for enhancing our ability to handle information. We know that from clinical research that psilocybin enhances a variety of different kinds of social behaviors. It makes us more sociable, reducing startle responses, reducing recognition of sad faces, reducing fearful reactions, uh, and it reduces the sense that we're being socially excluded. On the other hand, it enhances emotional self-control and tolerance and stimulates pro-social attitudes and social connectedness. The research done by Griffiths and others at John Hopkins shows that single dose of psilocybin has a pro-social altruistic effect that persists for more than a year and confirmed by third-party observers. So we became more pro-social under the effects of psilocybin. We see this in studies that look at psychological measurements of extroversion and openness, which are enhanced, and the reduction of neuroticism. So the experiences that psychedelics induced made us more altruistic beings, very powerful. It also enhanced our intrapersonal and interpersonal intelligence, the ability to perceive what others are thinking, uh, the, the notion of telepathy is widespread in psychedelic experiences, whether or not it's truly telepathy or just we think we understand people better, the experience is there. Uh, and it enables us to better understand what other people are thinking about us to interject other people's perspectives. So our interpersonal and interpersonal intelligences are being enhanced by these substances and our ability to relate to others socially are also being enhanced. It enhances uh, euphoria, laughter, grinning, giddiness, playfulness, exuberance. It enhances cohesion of groups. It strengthens social bonds among people. And it gives people a, an increased sense of connectivity with others, all of which would have supported participation in the cognitive and cultural niche. It also enhanced various forms of cognition, this cycle integration. And the major researchers in psychedelics have part of this picture right, but I think they only got the first part. Uh, they talk about 
the, the lack of structure, the lack of coherence, the loss of priors, the loss of uh, habitual perceptual and conceptual uh, categorization. But what they miss is that it's not just an anarchic brain, as some have argued, it's an archaic brain. It's a brain that functions with its ancient cognitive capabilities rather than with the modern language-based ego-centered one. Clinical findings also show that there's a variety of improvements in cognitive representations, novel mental representations, enhanced mental imagery, greater cognitive flexibility, including the creation of unconventional associations and not normal conceptual linkages. A widely recognized effect of the psychedelics is their meaning enhancing effects. It gives us a sense of things being more real than real, more meaningful than normal, uh, more important than normal perceptions. And there's evidence that it enhances insightfulness and self-awareness. Also clinical research showing heightened creativity, more curiosity, greater imagination, insight, perspective change, and an improved ability for creative problem solving, all of which is directly related to creating cultural niches. We also have the effects of psilocybin in creating enhanced brain connectivity. I guess you know which one is the psilocybin model. What happens under psilocybin is that not only do we lose the priors, the top-down determination, we lose this prefrontal cortex's determination of what's most important and shift to a uh, lower level integration of information with the frontal cortex, the enhanced integration of the visual cortex with all the association areas and an augmented communication across the whole brain. We have a greater connectivity, a greater total functional connectivity in the brain than is normal and a reduction of what are normally separate and non-connected networks. So we have a state of global brain coordination and synchronization with a greater variety of connectivity states. So that is why I say it's not an archaic brain. I mean, it's not an anarchic brain, it's an archaic brain. The parts of the brain that normally don't connect together are all being brought together in connection. And this is another reason why the concept of psychointegration I think is, is so appropriate here. Also a variety of ways in which uh, our learning abilities are enhanced the relaxation of prior assumptions and beliefs, suspension of habitual networks created by the prefrontal cortex and the default mode network, allow us to have different perceptions, new ways of thinking. And this enhanced capacity is part of the physiological effects in terms of enhancing neuroplasticity in the brain, neurogenesis to creation of new neural networks, enhanced learning, extinction learning, which may have been one of the important effects of the psychedelics. You break your old cultural niche model to learn a new one when the old model isn't working anymore. Why? Because you have enhanced cognitive flexibility, enhanced sensitivity to the environment, and overall what the psychedelics that act upon uh, serotonin do is promote structural and functional plasticity in the brain, an ability to create new adaptations because the brain itself is creating new connections. It may in part be due to the impediment of reuptake that psychedelics have in the serotonin system, forcing the brain to find new pathways to transmit the information. I think an overall dynamic of psilocybin and the 5-H2 psychedelics has to be understood in terms of the disinhibition of the innate modules. Uh, what research by people such as Franz Wollenweider and Katrine Preller has shown is that a major dynamic of the brain on psychedelics is this cortical striatal thalamic cortical loops. These loops that go from the bottom of the brain up to the frontal cortex and back down, these are being liberated. And what's being freed is all these lower brain systems. When we look at the effects of psilocybin experientially, phenomenologically, to me, they all map on to what a gardener argued were innate intelligences or innate cognitive operators. Innate capacities acquired in the course of evolution because they were adaptive, such as animacy detection, as well as the ability to 
uh, infer the thoughts of others, the so-called mind reading, as well as the ability to internalize the social models of others as our own models, the internalization that occurs in socialization. Uh, we also have an enhanced ability uh, for understanding animals and animal behavior and innate capacity. Uh, we are able to engage in a variety of mimetic behaviors that are also innate operators, song and dance and chanting and imitation. And I think the most important one, although uh, Gardner didn't focus on this, is this visual spatial intelligence, the ability to see things and put pieces together in a visual uh, format. So the, these effects of psychedelics on the innate modules were uh, including things such as producing this idea of a living universe. Nature has self properties, human cognitive properties, creating spirits. There are other selves out there that we don't see, but they have thoughts and expectations for us. The incorporation of animals as self or as social other, as in uh, animal powers or in totemism. Uh, the out of body experiences being a special capability to disarticulate some of the normally integrated innate modules. And of course, the whole realm of supernatural thought. When uh, Gardner revised his uh, innate thought processes in the year 2000, he added two others. One was a metaphysical intelligence and the other was a spiritual intelligence. He recognized these were innate human capacities. So what are the overall dynamics here? Well, sensory enhancement and connectedness enhance access to normally unconscious information. In essence, getting better access to pre-verbal cognitive functions, a cycle integration of behavioral, emotional, and cognitive information, a cognitive expansion, where synesthesia was probably the first form of symbolic thought long before we ever were able to speak in any symbolic kind of way, and an overall enhanced connectivity of the whole brain. Uh, with the novel integration of brain networks. So the adaptive effects would include amplification of sensory acuity. So it could have made us better hunters and gatherers and a better sense of connection with the environment that brought in this visual representation system and enhanced our pro-social tendencies to share those visual representations. It gave us improved cognition, better learning, ability to modify learned behaviors that were interrupted by the psychedelics it also stimulated intrinsic healing processes. Now we have a wide variety of contemporary clinical literature that shows psilocybin has a variety of important healing effects. And of course, it stimulated the development of shamanism, cosmology, healing, dramatic enactments, and various forms of symbolism. So from an evolutionary perspective, what we have in the context of psychedelics is a recognition that these plants have a long-term evolutionary relationship with humans, we evolved enzymatic systems to utilize these things that are considered plant toxins. They produce spiritual states of consciousness that linked us to others and linked us to understandings that were part of our unconsciousness. They integrated important aspects of our brain and amplified our capacities for consciousness by the integration of what were normally unconscious, unconscious processes, enhanced our capacity for introspection. And so created the foundation for shock shamanism in ritual cure in ways that still have important implications for humans today. So the facts are there in psychedelic sociality and human evolution. Uh, I think that we provided what I would consider to be a, a very convincing argument about why it is that psychedelics were part of human evolution. Uh, someone might ask, can you prove that? You know, can you prove the stone date theory? Science doesn't prove things. Science falsifies things. And I have a very simple falsification. My hypothesis is the major differences between the human brain and the chimpanzee brain have to do with the areas of the brain stimulated by psilocybin. This would be a way of establishing that through a Baldwinian effect, psilocybin exercised an environmental influence, selecting for those aspects of human genetics and cognitive and social and emotional capability that made us more capable of participating in the cultural niche. Thank you. Fantastic.
Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate that. I'm going to spotlight you for everyone. That was just phenomenal. Uh, <laughs> Thank you so much. Sure. I'm, I'm glad I'm back. The signal dropped for a while. <laughs> no, you're back. You're good. <laughs> You're back and i think that the recording worked well so, so thank you everybody um i did see some questions in the chat although i did want to ask first how do we i guess one of the biggest challenges we have with uh, psychedelics and especially now uh, now as they're becoming more i guess mainstream how do we work towards bridging this gap between shamanism and the ancient respect that we have for them and you know al allowing them a pathway into the modern world that we are in and i'm still giving them the, the the level of respect that they need well i mean it's a, a complex set of issues because shamanism functioned in a very different kind of you know, social context than we have today um you know, but i think probably the biggest implication that i see in terms of you know, future clinical applications is that we need to move from this you know, psychotherapy model, you know, the one on one between a therapist and a client, which is prohibitively expensive in the context of, you know, eight to 12 hour sessions and perhaps the necessary follow up. We need to move to more of a, a communal model, a group therapy model, a, a retreat model. Yes. I think that, you know, the, this is probably one of the biggest impediments to cost effective use of psilocybin and you know, psilocybin research as well. And that is we need to find new kinds of models that enable you know more cost effective approaches to you know, dealing with a number of people at the same time which i think is also going to enhance the overall therapeutic effectiveness of psilocybin in the sense that i think one of its intrinsic properties is to enhance our connectivity with others sure. and when we look at some of the major problems in health today that you mentioned in the beginning ranging from depression particularly treatment resistant depression and the addictions and you know post-traumatic stress syndromes you know, all of these are characterized by people who lack effective social connectivity and so i think one of the key aspects of making psilocybin a more effective treatment is to enable you know its use in a context in which social support is forthcoming present i'm just thinking that one can actually make this part of the integration process as well one actually has group sessions post treatment right well i, mean, I think that you know in essence the, the importance of the the therapeutic dynamic is not just the internal reset and the enhancement of serotonergic functioning but it's also changing our behavior and Absolutely. changing our behavior particularly in relation to significant others 100 percent, 100 percent. i want to open up the floor now if um if anybody has got questions by all means um i'm gonna allow if, I, allow people to i picked up one earlier i don't know <laughs> i'm not themselves. seeing my chat right now but uh i have this one question someone asked do we know if psilocybin evolved multiple times in the fungi evolutionary tree and if so how many times uh, i'm not aware of worldwide genomic studies on the psilocybin containing mushrooms but when we look at the the wide variety of genre that have psilocybin we're led to conclude that perhaps there was independent evolution in different genre of, of mushrooms. Certainly the wide variety of species of psilocybin and paniolus and other, you know, coplangia that have psilocybin attest to a variety of, of evolutionary divergences within a common line, a common species. So I think that, you know, given the very close similarity between serotonin and psilocybin and the widespread presence of serotonin it, it was out there to be evolved on it across you know long periods of time and so there's probably a lot of independent evolutions of this you know, psilocybin producing capacity in mushrooms very good does anybody have any other questions i'm not so quiet <laughs> Michael, can I ask you, the studies that you've done, how many sessions uh, people participating in the studies have done before you could conclude that those changes has happened? Okay, well, first, I, I don't do 
studies. I'm not a clinician. I'm a, an anthropologist, you know, who tries to synthesize stuff from evolutionary anthropology and ethnography and contemporary clinical studies. Uh, but if I understand that the core of your question, how, how many sessions does it take to produce change? Yeah, one. One. And this is what's really clear in the context of treatment resistant depression. You know, you give people who, you know, for seven years or more have been taking pharmaceuticals for depression and don't see any relief, you know, give them psilocybin. Post session, they're better off. You know, the next day, they're better off. A week later, they're still better off. A month later, they're still better off. I think the follow-ups have gone perhaps to six months now, but I mean, it's, it's not like you got to take psilocybin every day to get a, a clinically notable effect. One good session can produce a reset and we don't understand all of the reset, but what I think the overall dynamic suggests is that people are changing their overall emotional states because the way in which the psilocybin directly regulates on a short-term basis, the serotonogic system, but the serotonogic system is the master neuromodulator for the body. And I think if you can get a serotonogic reset in some fundamental ways, then you have the ability for prolonged effects. But, you know, the more antidotal literature from, for instance, studies on the use of psilocybin for cluster headaches and other kinds of you know, these serious kinds of, you know, suicidal headaches that people have. Um, you know, perhaps every three to six months, every six months to a year may be sufficient treatment to maintain the kind of, you know, dramatic changes we see from a single session. Thank you so much. Michael, go for it. Okay, well, I mean, the only other thing that I would have to say is that you know, one of the big challenges to go for it. I don't know if there was Sorry, a question. I, I apologize. <laughs> we had another question for Michael Raymond, who's one of the participants. And I will oh, actually say that Michael is a volunteer here at, at uh, MMA, and he's actually a veteran. And he can speak firsthand about the power of these treatments in his um, recovery process. Great. How you going, Michael? Um, yeah, as Alan said, I've, I've actually experienced this. I was a 16 year veteran had some mental health battles and and i had one powerful experience over in south america and peru and which uh really helped me out of my own mental health stuff and uh i now speak about it along with mind medicine and and, and all of that um so yeah i'm well aware of the power of these medicines um what i was going to ask was do you know of cultures that had it embedded into their uh into their structure that I've heard this before, but I couldn't remember where I heard it from or whether it's been backed up that, uh, that some uh, cultures used to, before the warriors would return to their society or into the, back into their community, they had to sit with the shaman, they had to sit with these medicines uh, to heal the traumas involved and or reset them into, you know, the more uh, empathetic environment of the community, you know, when they they've sort of switched that part off in the in the war environment or battle. Yeah. Frozen, I think. Michael. Michael, have you dropped out? I think he has. Let's see what happens. I think in the meantime, I'm, I'm going to share, share some of the last slides. And then if Michael does join us again, he can answer Michael's question. So just to give everybody a brief overview as to what we are doing at MMA to help achieve the ecosystem to allow access to these treatments. So our four key pillars stand around awareness and also knowledge building so through that we have events like these webinars which are free we held a summit last november which is actually virtual and that attracted about a thousand people we've also started a chapter program so if you are based in australia um, by all means do please um, connect with us the chances are we do have a chapter a chapter in your local area and the chapters are really a, a, a um, grassroots movement we have over 35 at the moment with i think over 1400 members so it's just phenomenal and now growing weekly um, we have started a formal 
training program, which is focused towards practitioners. So that's the CPAP program, and that's headed by the My Medicine Institute, which has um, been spun out of MMA towards the end of last year. Um, and we are also holding other shorter workshops as well. We are working together with the TGA on establishing a framework to help deliver these medicines from a legal perspective. And we, are, um, we are also sourcing the medicines as well. And we have engaged with the research and the university sector as well. You know, last year, Monash University, which by the way, has now been ranked number one in the world for uh, pharmacology. So that's just phenomenal. So we have partnered with them and they have established the Neuromedicines Discovery Center, which is focused on more um, psychedelic research. And we are looking at promoting and funding other uh, trials which are coming up slowly. Um, and also these webinars are, are free, but we do encourage people to, to, to make them a small donation by, a, by a, a website. And we have started taking crypto donations as well, by the way. So that's a really <laughs> breakthrough. Um, and here are some ways to um, start getting involved, start, start having these sort of conversations. You can come and also volunteer oh. um, with us. We do have content on our website that we can share and it, it's free, we are open source. So by all means, go through our learn section it will take you months and months and months to go through everything on, on there. Um, start speaking to your doctors. If you are a doctor, do consider joining CPAT. There are uh, scholarships available, and I will send out some more information about that tomorrow when I send out a copy of these slides as well as a recording of Michael's talk. And just briefly, Michael, so that's Michael's about CPAT. Oh, Michael's yeah. back. Fantastic. So I'll, I'll just finish up here. We do have the chapters I've spoken about that. We do have an online shop um, and like I said earlier the TGA is coming out with a public submission round um, at the end of this month so I um, mean the next 10 days they are going to announce a round of public submissions that public submission round is going to be open for just 20 days so we will send out some correspondence about that and a guide on how how the public can make submissions to the TGA ultimately it's a public support which will help a create change and here are some of our upcoming sessions from now all the way up until October and there are more to be announced and with that I'm going to go back to Michael Winkerman hold on a second Michael where yeah. is Michael back I, I didn't hear Michael Raymond's question though uh, so well he's he back it. Michael Raymond hey Michael yeah, I was, so I was talking about, yeah, just that I was a veteran myself, had my own battles and, uh, you know, had some therapy and, and healing experience with the medicines. I was just asking if you know of cultures that had embedded in their routine to bring back warriors, they had to sit with shamans or sit with the medicine before they were integrated back into the community. Did any cultures with their, uh, you know, warriors of the time or, you know uh what we call military men or, or whatever um yeah do you know of any cultures that had that in there there's not many good ethnographic case studies of the use of you know, the psychedelics in this kind of context the only one that i know of is not a particularly enheartening example which were the the, the hivaro of south america that used ayahuasca and they used ayahuasca to motivate them to carry out overnight head hunting expeditions. And then when you came back with your captive head, you were supposed to stay inside of your hut for like two to four weeks taking ayahuasca every day and not going out and doing anything in order to engage in rituals to protect yourself from vengeance from the spirit of the person that you killed. So not a particularly encouraging model, but yes, there, there, there were these kinds of practices. In terms of the use of mushrooms in this way, I'm not aware of it. In fact, until recently, the only places in the world where it seemed that there were surviving mushroom healing traditions was in Mesoamerica, exemplified in Maria Samita and the Mazatecs. Uh, when I was in India a couple of years ago, we discovered that there are still mushroom ceremonies and mushroom psychedelic mushroom uses in local villages that has never ever been recorded in the ethnographic record. So we have a 
a short re reference to that in an article that's coming out soon. Mm -hmm. And we're starting on another article to try to you know, promote research into what is in fact still existing psilocybin mushroom healing traditions in India. Yeah, thank you for that. Well, if I've got just a few minutes left, I'm just going to make a plug for a different means, model for of thinking about how it is that we use these mushrooms. And of course, the, the big money dynamic these days has been, you know, the, the commercialization and medicalization of these mushrooms. But anybody who looks at the contemporary models of doing this, it's like, no, this is a, a $5,000 a weekend cost, 10000 I mean, most people aren't going to have access to that, you know. I, I don't even have money to pay, you know, three or five thousand dollars for a two week retreat. You know, that's a lot of money uh, for most people. So how do we get to models that democratize not just the use, which was the decriminalization model, but how do we accompany that by support systems so that we can get people who can use mushrooms on their own or in small groups and still get access to the kind of therapeutic support and, and you know, psychedelic integration post session? that will enable the more widespread use of this without the medical model being the only way to access it. To me, the, the biggest problem we face these days is that the medicalization is once again gonna make this something that's largely inaccessible to people. Very good. And I will say that, say finally that that's one of the missions of us here, here at My Medicine Australia. We are looking at making these medicines affordable and accessible to everybody in need and as we work towards bringing these medicines to patients we will have to start developing a framework and you know ultimately we will hopefully get these treatments subsidized whether it's through our medicare system or the or through the private health funds or you know even us as a charity but that's something which has to be developed over time sarah do you want to have one last go Hello. Um, good evening. Um, one thing I'm interested by is so far there seems to be a focus on um, quite um, large single doses of psilocybin. Um, I was wondering whether there has whether you've uncovered any evidence of um, longer term micro dosing of psilocybin, which would kind of mimic um, the, the, the current way in which antidepressants are used or anxiolytics are used. Um, but I just wonder whether it, whether you found any evidence, as I say, of, of there kind of being a like a routine micro dosing um, uh, way of using psilocybin within more primitive communities. Well, within, in the pre-modern world, it does not seem that you know, deliberate therapeutic use was microdosing. It was always, you know, major ceremonial use. Although, uh -huh. interestingly, some of the models were that it was just the therapist, you know, the shaman that was using the mushrooms and the patients weren't necessarily taking them, you know, with the idea that it's an energetic field created by the healer that helps, you know, the transformational processes. Uh, in terms okay. of the microdosing evidence, I mean, on, on one hand, there's a number of studies that suggest that people personally report benefits from microdosing. But on the other hand, the extent to which they've been able to carry out, you know, sort of blinded studies on the general population self administering, there does not appear to be an effective, you know, change produced by microdosing. It, it seems like it may be more a, a psychological effect rather than a physiological effect. I think we also have to take into consideration, though, what's the mental state of people that feel like I've got to do this every day. Um, mm. So what my personal experience mm. has led me to prefer is something that's between a microdose and a psycholytic dose. And it's not every day, it's every two to four days. And it's not, you know, a dose that, you know, keeps you from doing what you ordinarily do, but it's not the technical microdosing in which you're not supposed to be able to perceive the effect. To me, this intermediate dose, which may be around a half a gram, is that, you know, two or three hours later, you're just smiling for no good reason at all. And you know what the reason is, you know? So uh, to me, that's another important area to look at. It's not the everyday microdosing. It's not, 
you know, the non-perceptible dose, but it's enough to boost your serotonin system a little bit. So that would be on a regular basis, Michael? Well, it, you know, we or, in don't have... or in a retreat setting, what, what, what would that, so, how would that be? How would that be enacted? Well, you know, and, and the way I've done this in my personal experience is, is doing a, a good five gram dose, you know, and then starting three days later, you know, you do the half a gram dose every several days and, and try to use that as a way of enabling yourself to mentally prolong the effects. It's sort okay. of like, you know, give, giving you the basis to help reorient your post session psychointegration by having the little boost that allows you to get that serotonin boost that then gives you the mood elevation and gives you the sort of the motivation to focus on the changes you need to incorporate. Okay, and that would be done um, how many times and, and how, would that be assisted as well by a therapist? Well, I mean, there, there's no you know, study basis for me to give you an informed answer. Personally, mm -hmm. what I find in my experience is that as I do this, then after a couple of weeks, the, the you know three or four day you know interval of the doses sort of falls off and i'm not doing it anymore and then so after okay. a month or two it's like okay time for a bit, another big dose and try to reinitiate this process of you know every two to four days you take this intermediate dose to sort of put you back into the mood state 